Hey, welcome to the 343rd episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patron Jack Meggers. I'm Oren Kaplan. And I'm Matt Enlow. Today we've got Cassie Brooksbank on the show. She's a commercial director and also a feature director. We just kind of shoot the shit with her. She's an action comedy director, loves to move the camera, and she laid a perfect little listicle for us. She just kind of like served us up her five principles for great action directing. And so that really kind of structures the conversation. We dig in on each of those points. She walks us through what makes them good. Just kind of a primer on how to think about and approach action directing. So it's really exciting. I met her just on Instagram. She's wrapped at the same company I am, but she just reached out to me and we had some coffee and she's just really cool and fun to talk to. And I don't know what your experience is, Matt, but I feel like there's two types of directors that I meet. There's Mm -hmm. the type that are like so excited to meet other directors and talk about craft and business and exchange ideas. And then they're the ones that are like, okay, so you're also a director. Why do I care? There's definitely the standoffish ones. She is not one of those. The second I met her, it was like, so how do you make your treatments? How do you do this? How do you get job? How do you meet this person? How do you do that? And it's like, I just really enjoy people that like talking about Mm -hmm. how they do what they do. And I, I do honestly think that like, like it's not a film specific thing. It's like, there are certain types of people that just like love discussing about how th- things work, whether it's mm-hmm. like working with actors or building devices or programming computers. It's a good episode. Like clearly we could have talked to her for like another two hours and hopefully Easy. we'll have her back on the podcast about just movies that inspired her and and how we we do our jobs. Before we chat with her, I did want to also congratulate our editor, Noah Bayshore. He just shot a movie. Hey, hey. Round of applause, Noah. Hell yeah, buddy. Can't wait to see it, to give some incredible notes on it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But Mm -hmm. also, we're really happy he's back to editing the the podcast. We are happy on all cylinders, on all fronts. Glad he's back. Glad he shot the movie. Glad to help. So welcome back, Noah, which is a perfect segue into our Patreon. Patreon.com slash just shoot it pod is a way to support the show. That's how we pay Noah. And Noah, in turn, takes the money that we pay him and funnels it directly into his very first feature. So that's that's a circle of life story right there, guys. That's just filmmakers helping filmmakers helping filmmakers. Literally, Noah was texting us. <laughs> yeah, he texts his photos to be like, he's like, I just bought a fish tank with your with the one you, you guys me. yeah thanks man this prop in the shot is from you so if you are a patron thank you you're helping us out you're helping keep the show going certainly Oren and i couldn't do it without your support so uh, every little bit helps if you've ever wanted to like throw us a couple bucks maybe buy us a coffee or a beer this is a way to virtually do that so go to patreon.com slash just shoot a pod if you're feeling extra generous or you're feeling extra inspired thanks to the show you can go ahead and buy yourself a just shoot it pod hat which is very cool. And also you may have seen some of our previous guests wearing them on set. So you could be part of the cool kids club, go to patreon.com slash just shoot a pod to throw us a couple bucks. And I actually got a message on Instagram from one of our listeners, Earl Martin, who was like, Hey, I'd love to just throw a few dollars to you, but I don't want to sign up for this recurring Patreon payment. And he asked if he could just sign up for one month and then unsign up and I said, yes. <laughs> so yeah, you can do that. Uh, yeah, you can definitely do thing. that. Yeah, we will love you all regardless of what you do, but it really helps us keep going and um, makes it all worth it. Patreon.com slash just shoot a pod is where you can find out about that. Anything else, Matt? Should we hop into the rest of the episode? After a word from our sponsor. Okay, we are here with Cassie Brooksbank. How's it going? Hey guys, what's up? Hello, welcome to the show, Cassie. I'm honored, humbled, and privileged to be here. It's a lifelong dream of mine. I've made it. <laughs> you keep saying honored, humbled, and privileged. Is that like a thing that you tell everyone? Like any, when they're like, Cassie Brooksbank, the double latte, double shot latte, honored. do you say that? It's your yeah, Twitter I mean, bio, right? <laughs> uh, no, I think my Twitter bio is like, I love to blow shit up or something like that which is true but you know i'm just practicing my my oscar speech honored humbled and privileged baby your your twitter bio is i'm gonna i'm gonna take 2017 down like she's my bitch yeah Um, sorry i'm I'm making fun of cassie because i checked out her website and it said like copyright 2019 on it or something 
Oh, and great. Like, now I have to change that before this yeah, fucking yeah. podcast comes out. <laughs> I was like, Cassie, stop putting Thank the you, years Warren. on your things. Appreciate that. Great. Out me in public, why don't you? <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, we talked about this off the podcast, but it's like, to me, one of the rules of like building out a portfolio is don't put years <laughs> on anything because sure. that makes you have to rebuild it like every six months. Yeah, pro um, tip. I'm gonna. I'm definitely gonna use that. So hopefully, I will delete the year before this. <laughs> now I. Now I just. Now I just have to keep it because. It's, part it's of a yeah, pretty strong joke, actually. If it was like a little bit older, I think maybe it only gets better with age, really. You know. Yeah, we we're we're about to do a full rebrand, so stay tuned. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk uh, for a second about how I met Cassie because uh, she's on the same commercial roster as I am with Great Guns. Uh, and I had posted on Instagram that I had just signed with Great Guns and I tagged Great Guns and I'm assuming Cassie follows Great Guns. So she saw my post and she just reached out and she was like, hey, what's up? I'm Cassie. I'm also with Great Guns. Uh, do you want to grab lunch or something? That's very then- cool of you, Cassie. Yeah. Well, I, I don't do that for everyone. Only the best. <laughs> no, but you had literally no idea who I was. <laughs> I saw Oren's work and was instantly jealous and was like, oh, I have to meet this guy. So Let me ask. Then we did, got lunch. Did you find the podcast and di- was that a deciding factor at all? I've known about the podcast. Actually, one of my good friends, Savannah Block, uh, she's oh. the one that does uh, the Sandbox. I know so Savannah I know her. very well. And, I, yeah. and then she, I think she had mentioned you guys. So I've been, I've been meaning to check out the podcast, but... What's better? What what a better way to check it out than just like being a guest, you know? <laughs> so Cassie sends me a message on Instagram and I'm like, oh, cool. It's So when you join a, a new company or e- even if you get a new job, like being, you know, staff director or something, I think there is something incredibly cool about someone who has basically the same job as you saying like, hey, let's go get lunch and let's talk about like how everything works. So I was like, uh yeah. Also, I obviously checked out Cassie's work and she she has I mean, it's just like really awesome, loud, funny, vibrant, action filled work that I was like, oh, wow, I, I'd love to shoot something like that one of these days. Um, <laughs> like, this is cool. Wow. Now I'm blushing. Wow. Yeah. And so Cassie, uh, b- before we go any further, though, can you describe your work to us a little bit? Just real quick. Action comedy is kind of my bag. Perfect. But yeah, Perfect. goofy action comedy. I love to blow shit up. Awesome. It's, a, it's why I'm in movies. She has been <laughs> described as the female Tony Scott and also as the female Michael Bay. I think I've reached the pinnacle. You guys have just <laughs> made me, made my life here. So thank you for that. But <laughs> so. yeah, I mean, th- th- those guys have been like from day one, I've just always wanted to make big action movies. And so that's kind of why I started in commercials in the first place because like all my favorite filmmakers came up that way like Mm -hmm. yeah tony scott michael bay gore verbinski yeah uh, fincher obviously you know all the and then by the time they got to movies they really knew what they were doing so hopefully by the time i get to movies i will know what i'm doing (laughs) there you go um you know my favorite michael bay commercial is the the aaron burr commercial do you know this commercial oh got milk yeah got got milk milk. oh my god it's so good it's so 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 good tiny film school tangent the thing that maybe is underrated about film school is that like you you show up on the first day and if you're anything like me you kind of have like expectations of like who everybody's favorite filmmakers are and for the most part you're more or less right depending on whatever your age is you walk in and you love david fincher or tarantino or wes anderson or whatever you know there's like a handful of like the filmmaker du jour right um right. Uh, and then you meet your friend who's like i'm obsessed with jackie chan movies and i know everything about jackie chan and you're like oh i didn't even realize that was a th- thing you could be into what have i been wasting my life on and so like i remember the day i met like my first michael bay friend and i'm still dear friends with them i love a person who is passionate about something specific and it kind of for the most part doesn't matter what that thing is do you know what i mean like with obvious exceptions but like oh like i love movies and being friends with a person who is like no the rock is the best movie that's ever been made 
makes oh, me I mean, love the, the rock five. more. Sure. <laughs> yeah. It is right. great. It delivers. I mean, I'm, used, I'm kind of used to being taken down at bars when I, but like, I think I'm not kidding. I think Pirates of the Caribbean is the best mil- movie ever made. Like, full stop. <laughs> The Gore Verbinski trilogy is perfect. It's followed shortly by Bad Boys. <laughs> and like, wait, wait, hold on. You when you know, say Gore like, this is the pinnacle of cinema. Gore Verbinski, Michael Bay, and Tony Scott. The sure. holy trinity of movies. But you, are you saying that and we're throw, th- throw Guy Ritchie in there too? Oh, like, all right. Well some extra spice. Yikes. You know? I was yeah. with you, Cassie. I was like <laughs> right I mean, there with you. Wait, and, you don't like Guy no, Ritchie? Everyone loves Guy Ritchie, Ritchie, but he's very hit or miss. You gotta admit. I think he's 100% miss. Actually. No, come on. <laughs> yeah. Snatch, oh my God. Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Hey, we, I will yeah, put Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes is not so bad. Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes is not so bad. Uh, man, man from Hunkle. <laughs> man from, from Hunkle. It's like freaking Henry Cavill and Army Hammer. Like, what else do you need? This you is know? exactly. Like, I, I've, <laughs> boy. It, USC students listening right now, uh, if you see like a weird silver like dad wa- wandering around campus, say hi, because I miss film school that bad. <laughs> Thanks to this conversation. <laughs> anyway, or you were going to say something important. What, what oh, you yeah. Were well, us? it's hard to not jump all over the place because I already have like 100 questions about <laughs> your transition from commercials to features or I guess parallel paths um, and also about defining yourself as an action director. But just to back up a little bit to the topic we were talking about, which was a director meeting other directors, which I do think that like a lot of our listeners mm-hmm. would love to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, we get emails all the time, people asking us advice, not because they think we have good advice, but just because we're like other directors to bounce mm-hmm. ideas, like questions off of. Like, should I submit my short to here or there? Do what, you know? Yeah. Um, well, what would you do in this situation? Yeah. It's yeah. the point of the show in many ways. Right. Right. And also you went to well, I mean, that's, that's kind of. I mean, well, yeah, I think that's kind of one of the trickiest things though, right? Is like, we're always around other people doing all their jobs, you know, and they have a whole support team, but it's like, you're kind of the only person on set doing your job. And it's a unique position, right? Because you're, you're part of the crew, but then you're, you're also like the head of it all. Mm -hmm. But then you're also in this world of, you know, especially in commercials, you have to deal with the production company, which has its own politics going on. And then you have the agency Mm -hmm. and then, you know, it's like you have to deal with all these different worlds. You're a nation uh, of one for sure. Yeah. And then, you know, like there's no freaking like (laughs) user manual can never. And the coolest thing about meeting other directors too, is like everybody has a very different process. And even, you know, it's like I try to meet as many directors as possible and just get a sense of how they do things. But the craziest thing too, is sometimes people with, similar styles have very different Mm -hmm. processes you know michael bay his shooting styles always been something i really aspired to emulate but apparently you know i've had conversations with a producer that works with him and apparently he doesn't storyboard which to me is heresy because i'm a very storyboarded director like to me when you're putting together an action scene step one is storyboarding and that's really how i figure out especially if it's something's going to blow up right you want to make sure that everyone knows what shots you want yeah yeah and i mean that that's always like a huge part of how i communicate what's happening Mm -hmm. to the team so the idea that he's putting together which you know what i think are some of the best action sequences of all time you know i'm sure he, he storyboards movie sequences or something but at least on commercials i don't think he boards and that's nuts so it's just like the more directors you can speak with and learn from their, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like everybody's different, but it's good to just kind of like get a sense of what your peers are doing, what your idols are doing, you know, because it's just, it's a lonely job, ironically, because, you know, I think a lot of us have to be extroverts and be comfortable working with a lot of different people, but a lot of times, you know, it's like you're kind of on your own. So director support groups are yeah. super helpful yeah. you know <laughs> i do wonder if that's like a power move because i i like shot listing and i like storyboarding and i like making a 3d render every once in a while and finding references and making look books but as soon as the production company or like a producer is like hey orn you got to get us the shot list by tomorrow i'm like why the fuck <laughs> do you think i'm gonna make a shot list like <laughs> you mm-hmm. know it, like it's like when they tell me how to do my process, I like it kind of annoys me, even though I understand why they're doing it. Um, to, to me, it's like or when they don't give you enough time to, you know, I love when yeah. they need the storyboards tomorrow and it's right. Like and you don't Friday. have a location yet. You know, you're like, just give me till Monday. You know, no one's going to freaking look at anything over the weekend. So you're like, just 
you don't also, understand i'll be working like 12 hours a day no one's no so one's like, looking at your shot day, list you know? they're looking at boards yeah. they're not looking at shot lists no one knows yeah. what, yeah. what you're what you know why a means or like wa i mean you know like it's like oh come on what, does, what wide angle what's wa yeah. i never use that yeah i'll say wide angle all wide. The time. Oh, or like see you oh yeah or, yeah or I'll, yeah i'll do like if i want like if i'm talking about lens choice in addition to composition for sure like i'm not gonna like put like 32 millimeter on the shot list but i know some people who do like some people get yeah. pretty prescriptive on that just to kind of like i guess all i'm saying yeah. is i never d- write wa i always write wide the word wide <laughs> yeah I, I don't do du- i've never done w i do see you see you mcu yeah you yeah. yeah. next um Ooh. christmas well cassie you actually we had just had lunch the other day and i was asking you you just shot a commercial in turkey yes I was asking you what it was about and the way you were describing it, you weren't saying then close up on this and then insert on this and then wide shot on this. But I feel like the way you pitch and the way you describe scenes like implies shot sizes. Like you're like this woman, she's like lost in this crowd. And then all of a sudden we realize there's a man with a sign next to her, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's like that implies like, right. Kind of closer shot to wider shot. And I feel like you're, I'm curious about your, pitching like how it's developed and like what's what your method is because i felt like you just describing to me what your commercial is about like if you ask me what my commercial is about i'd be like eh, it's like a tax thing it's like i don't know mm-hmm. it's someone mm-hmm. like getting ripped off and this tax person's <laughs> helping them out um but you're like so it starts out with this like a big crowd you know um like tell me a little bit about like how you you learn to pitch and it, it has I mean, like a I guess very it, action director feel to you know, the way. You yeah, kind of but I mean, I guess I guess things. that's why I because like to be honest, even in my uh, treatments, I put the shot list in there, and and, and I actually kind of agonize over that because I'm like, you know, oh, and I, I, you know, usually I'll put in about. I try not to do over thirty shots, but I'm I have a very cutty style, mm-hmm. so like it gets packed. So I have to kind of like, you know, thirty th- shots for a thirty I'll second write, commercial. Yeah, I, I mean, it's rare I'll hold on a shot longer than a second. Like that's like a long <laughs> shot for me, you know, but, but do you the, not the do is, like, is do- like long dolly moves or drone shots or crane shots? No, I, every I do. Yeah. But they're fast, you know, <laughs> yeah. rip long and shot, fast. You know? but uh, yeah, I have a very it's like high v- octane <laughs> shooting style, you know, like, or I mean, if it is a long shot, it's like, fuck tripods, tripods are boring. Right. <laughs> but I think like the way, the way I think about things, it's like, that it does I kind of agonize over the pitches and I spend way too long on these treatments but that's kind of how I figure everything out mm-hmm. so it's like you have to kind of think about it especially if you're specializing in action in the way the shots are cutting together and like how it all connects and that's just how it makes sense in my brain and until I kind of figure out that uh you know that puzzle it to me it's like I don't really know what I'm doing, but then once I figure that out, it's like, yeah, okay, we're tracking with her, and she's like, you know, going toward trying to get through the crowd, and then oh, cut to a massive wide. You see, you know, it's like you really kind of get a sense of the scope and like where you're directing the audience's eye in a lot of these things, because like, mm-hmm. like when you're, especially when you're directing action, you know, you're trying to tell the story in a way that's really dependent on the shot design, you know. And how it all fix, fits together. So you, you can't just, you know, like like I haven't, I'm coming up through commercials, right? So I haven't had a lot of the benefit of sitting in a dialogue scene for five minutes, right? Mm-hmm. So you really have to tell the story through the way the shots are fitting together. So that's just kind of how I I think about it, you know, but And how, yeah, how did I, you I mean, learn that? Like, was it from watching like Michael Bay movies or... Was it something a little bit more intentional? This is kind of the interesting thing I think about hanging out with directors, right? Is everybody has a different process, but th- this I didn't really learn it from anywhere. This is just how it makes sense in my brain. And actually, if that's the most stressful part for me, almost mm-hmm. like coming up with storyboards and the shot list and like how that. And then once I know that, I, I can like see it all, you know. Mm-hmm. But like until I do that, I don't know what I'm doing, and I can't describe it to anybody. So I really spend a lot of time on that process. But I think it just, it's like, that's just how my brain works. Like I, I'm not so great with my right and my left, you know, like I need to kind of draw it out and see it. I've always been a really visual learner. Like even in, 
in class, I'd have to, even if I'm listening, it goes through one ear and out the other. I'd always like have to write notes, like exactly. And even on calls, like if, if I'm not like listen, you know, if, if I'm trying to like listen to what the other person says, if I'm just like jotting down what they're saying, I'll never read those notes again, but it helps me like stay engaged. And so like, I think just like, you know, and, and I, in high school, I drew the school comic strip. So I, I've always thought about things as like, you know, sequential uh, art picture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, and even just like, uh, I think I saw the Indiana Jones storyboards and, you know, when you start getting into this mm-hmm. stuff, you start like, Ooh, like, let me look at how this, you know, the making of this and you see how the story, you know, I, the storyboards have always been something I get really excited by. Or I think in pirates Two. Uh, Dub and Chess, the best, the best pirates, by the way. Go check it out. But th- that movie, I think, was the one that came out and changed my world. Right as I was like discovering filmmaking, and that was when they did these awesome behind the scenes stuff too. And mm-hmm. I think in that they really showed the pre production. And Gore Verbinski is like one of my favorite directors, but he always storyboards, and you could see in the behind the scenes how like all these sequences were storyboarded out, you know. And so, I guess just I think especially when we were coming up, there wasn't you know, you couldn't just Google how to do things. Also, uh, you know, I, I came, at USC too, like I, I came up, I was the last class to shoot on film. So it's like you would run out of film if you didn't, you know, sure. know exactly what you're shooting. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you kind of had to come, you know, storyboard it all. So I just think like all of those things. Just I think they've changed it I, now. Like you get like one card or something. <laughs> right yeah, but like every nobody nobody is doing yeah that. yeah like, you're please. deleting takes but i guess they're yeah. you're, they're supposed to like check the number sequencing i think is what they're doing yeah I, but you can change that can, you can change that i do like the idea to your point of of that forced limitation forcing you to kind of like make some premeditated decisions but uh, go, yeah. going back to your point about how like you put um your shot lists in treatments like as part of your pitch, I wonder if that's sort of similar to that's the action version of pitching jokes, right? Like whenever I get something, especially that's like true, pure comedy, like there's the yeah. expectation that I'm going to plus it. I'm going to add additional sure. things of some sort, you know, and like I'm pretty dialogue oriented. So like, you know, you pitch this or that or whatever. Um, but it sounds to me like if something is pure action, right mm-hmm. then it's a, maybe a little bit harder to um steer away from that you can pitch like different gags and set pieces there's all sorts of stuff that you can elaborate on but it, do you find that right. the shot list is the place where you're riffing where you're kind of plussing things and showing what you're doing or is it is it throughout the whole thing even when i pitch features usually i'll break down a scene like this as an example but usually when i'm, I'm doing a treatment this is kind of I, I start with just, you know, I'll read the script and then I'll write out, I'll do my version and write out, you know, I, I call, always call that the story section or in a feature mm-hmm. pitch, I'll call that the scene breakdown where I'm like, okay, so Jimmy, you know, he's, he's on the ground crawling and, you know, we're in a low angle and you're, you're kind of describing it, but we're in story form, like what you're seeing. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, they're all add jokes, you know, like they, you know, wouldn't it be funny if that, you know, as he's crawling, his hand goes into a mud puddle or mm-hmm, whatever the mm-hmm. hell, you know, I'll just start adding and plusing. And that's where it's more just like writing and you kind of putting all your ideas in there, the best version of it. And then the shot list part is what it's called. It, it's kind of like my come to Jesus moment, because like, actually, the reason I started adding the shot list is because. I would write these extravagant pitches and then it's like, Oh bitch, you have 30 seconds. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. these 70 shots aren't going to make it, you know? And you, you know, and you're like comic scene. Now you added like a dialogue scene and mm-hmm. you know, they don't, we don't have budget for sound or whatever. So it's more like, okay, this is the a version of what I want to shoot. And it's like, how do you realistically break mm-hmm. those ideas into like, so I, I call it an example shot list, but I'll like break down and and, and it, it helps me too because it's like, how are you actually going to pull this off? Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. it's it's great to yeah. throw in all the you know the kitchen sink and these ideas, but then I actually have to shoot this yeah. in like yeah, yeah. a day. So yeah. you know, it's, do you it, ever it feel like it's more like a reality check? You know, I love that so much. I am always like, dang, 
because I, I think Oren and I are both like pretty producer oriented. You know, we are aware of how long 30 seconds is. We're, we know what the yeah. budget is. You know, it's, it's yeah. the same thing. We've also been burned a hundred times for overshooting stuff, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. You've l- sure. you learned those lessons enough times. And then I think to myself like, ah, oh, there's some director who's like pitching the $10 million version of this, even though the budget isn't anywhere near that. And then, but are they, that's a better pitch. That's cooler. It would be cool if there was a helicopter exploded in the background of that shot or whatever. But do, are they booking those jobs thanks to that extravagant pitch? And then just like, you know, someone, they have to come to Jesus later or, you know what I mean? I always just try to go in with like, what do I, what is the potential of this idea? Like, what is the A list version of this? And because even if, even when you're writing out like the funny thing, you know, like for example, if you're like, oh, and then it blows up, like you could do that off screen, you know, uh-huh. if it comes to it. Sure. Like, yeah. I think there's like ways to like tell the best version of that story. And then when, when you have to, that's what the shot list does to me is like it realistically put you you know then you then you turn your producer hat on you're like okay how are we going to do this how are we going to think creatively and i think that that's also like a big important part of having a good team to work with a good Mm -hmm. line producer or executive producer to like be like you know like i I think on one spot i threw it basically the the idea was this guy it was a deodorant spot and this guy is getting so sweaty his jacket is like swelling up and i think i you know it starts encroaching on the other people in the subway or whatever and it Put, I, I thought it would be funny if this lady had a baby in the jacket, like push the baby's face up against the window. That's and, very funny. You know, and then, yeah. and then but before yeah. before that went to the producer or to the agency, the producer's like, "Yeah, we're not getting a baby in your." So, <laughs> did so you compromise? Kind of was like, it like a teenager? Back, you know, yeah, or, like, or, a, or a, like a businessman? I think I did. Yeah. I think I did a influencer girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you like go. Some girl that yeah, yeah. in a nice uh, outfit, yeah. like, absolutely. Would, Making fun of influencer girls. But I, I think it's important to have like a sh- that that's why directors should not be producers. Sure. And even like I think you you need to be aware of it. But if that's why there's two it's, it's two you know, jobs. It, that's why you yeah. like because even I have my own production company and I'm EP at some of that stuff, but like I always hire a line producer too, because if I you know, it's like I'll go bankrupt because it's mm-hmm. like if I'm or or I'm gonna be like compromised and like be like oh well i should just make this shittier because i'll make more money you know it's like you need somebody that that's why you have a producers because you need somebody to push against because if you're not trying to fight to make it the best version possible and you don't have someone to be like yo that's crazy you know how can we reimagine it within these constraints you know i I think that's the ideal way of working And, and i don't think you should go in like pitching something that you're not as excited because usually the agency will limit you too, you know, or the studio will, or, mm-hmm. will limit you or whatever. It's like, but you should go in with what actually excites you about the commercial. Cause I think like, at least for me, anytime I have like faked passion or like, you know, sure. I don't get the job. It's like when, it, when the job is really working, it's genuine. Like I'm really excited about making this. And I think that's what wins the jobs and you should go in with your a plan. Cause they're, you know, it's like, you can set if you set the bar super high, you might not ever hit the bar, but at least you can get close. Whereas, like, if you're already lowering the bar before you even tried to do anything, it's just going to get constantly lowered. And then at the end, you're like, oh my God, I want to kill myself. This yeah. spot's embarrassing. Sounds you know? like many jobs <laughs> I've done. In the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wait, can I ask you an, right. an action shot listing 101 type of question? So sometimes, <laughs> like, I'm shooting like a car chase or a fight or something like that. And I don't know exactly how we're going to cut it. I just kind of know where we're going to put the cameras, you know, Mm -hmm. like, you know, you want to see the car drive down and and get the geography. And yeah, yeah. Is that like really bad form? Like, like, should an action sequence (laughs) always be telling a story? This happens, which leads to this happening, which is like we see the because to me, like in any action car chasing, I'll probably shoot like a foot going down on a pedal because I know. I can use that to like excel, like cut to that whenever we want things to go to the next speed, you know? Um, But, uh, but I feel like in a shot list, especially in a commercial, you really want to be prescriptive as to like, this leads to this leads to this. 
It's not like we're going to shoot a bunch of cars driving and then figure out the story. Right. I mean, so this this is obviously with the caveat that every director's process is different, but I don't I don't work like that. Like I am only shooting stuff that I see in the edit. And that's because like I come from an editing background. Like I came up through post. Uh, I've cut a lot of my own work. Like I, I love being involved in the editing. So I, I always think of things like I shoot for the edit. That's kind of my MO. And so when I'm, I, I kind of have, I, I call it the don't be boring method to shooting action, but there's like five general principles I follow. But one of those rules is like to shoot for the edit. And yeah, when you're putting a, you know, a action scene together, you should think like even when I draw the storyboards, it's almost like I'm pre-cutting the movie, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So like, at least for me, that's a hallmark of directing good action is to like think about how it's going to cut because you need those pieces because you're moving you're moving too fast to just uh, you know other I get I, I, I guess some directors like Catherine Bigelow with Hurt Locker I think was doing a very different style, but if you're at least in traditional action set pieces i do think you need to be relatively you know prescribed to a certain way of cutting right so i guess i just think hold on people are going to kill me if we don't ask what the other four tenants are let's let's get to the other four tenants in a second but just for tenants but for uh for a quick second this this topic like i guess maybe it is a, a problem of thinking about producers and like matt said like we're him and i are very producer friendly but i think like Oh, putting the car mount, the hood mount on the car is going to take half an hour to get all set up and be driving the right direction and everything. So I should probably try to get two or three different shots out of this for the Get sequence. more cameras. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's not your problem. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, and, Cassie, I, mean, I not, like I'm, you. I'm, this I'm is kinda, great. This is right, though. I'm kind of, no, but I, I'm kind of kidding, but I'm not. Because, like, even, I've definitely shot, I've changed, we were supposed to shoot on red for this one job. And I ended up changing it to Sony A7S mm-hmm. because I would be able to get a lot more cameras and get the shots. And like it for the end product, it was more important to be able to get all the shots and have the flexibility of more cameras than, you know, like there's always a way and like, yeah, you're going to have to compromise somewhere, but like with a really great cinematographer and good lenses, you can make that look great, pretty good. Yeah. Especially if it's living on web, you know? So, I yeah. mean, it's all, there's or always a balance after but, one second. Yeah. Later, you might have to compromise, but when you're going to the team, don't think about the producing ramifications. At least, like I, at least I don't do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's right. You're on. compromising on the vision already, and, you, and then you, that's what your freaking team is for. Like, yo, this is what we want to do. How can we make this happen? When Gore Verbinski says, out. "I want a full yeah. pirate ship in Barbados or whatever." <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it's funny. Different. I'm pitching on something right now, and there's like um, a costume. And yeah. if we, if I do get the job, it will shoot very soon in like two weeks. And I showed this costume that I love. That this is what I think. You know, I want to show the agency of like what this costume should look like. And the producer's right. like, "There's no way we can get that costume in two weeks." Like it's uh, like uh. I saw. Like I, I looked up where you you found this reference from and we can't get it like it's in China and it'll take like a month. Mm -hmm. It's like a six week pre-order. Like, please don't put that in the treatment because we can't get that. Mm. You know, And it's like, it's tricky because I want to show them what I think is the best, but then the producers are already like telling me not to show them things that they don't know how to accomplish. And I guess that's what you, it's similar to your baby story. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's frustrating, especially when you, that's that's really an annoying part of commercials sometimes just because all the different layers you have to get through mm-hmm. where you're like, can I just talk to the agency directly and we'll see if this is a, okay, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. like if they're stoked it. on it, maybe yeah. they'll find the money or find the schedule. I, I'm actually yeah. doing a job right now. Talk about pressure, but there the budget wasn't locked and the client was like, hey, if Oren pitches some really incredible ideas that like we just love... <laughs> We'll find more money we'll to find pull the them money. Off. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, I'm, I, I don't know what you want. Yeah, me. I'm just <laughs> pitching you like my small pluses on your script. Okay? The kid just <laughs> takes a bite of the cookie and smiles. <laughs> Did I tell you about this project? <laughs> no, is that is that, that it? No, there's there's literally <laughs> that shot is storyboarding. 
<laughs> yeah, that's so funny. You did not tell me that. No, my my wife uh, coaches kids in acting and she talks about uh, a bite and like all the time as the like is like that. Mm, Mikey likes it. Like just like how to do that authentically so it's not cheesy. So it doesn't feel like a commercial from the 50s. Ew, I might anyway. need to call her before I go shoot this thing. Yeah. I mean, truly, you, by all means. Some yeah. commercial auditions are like awful when it's like the role is smiling, you know, yeah. <laughs> like usually yeah. I'll just Gosh. make them do some random monologue or improv something. Just, just to, like, something. Get a sense yeah, they yeah. Can, yeah. Cause it's like, imagine like driving across town in rush hour to like smile. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, I we're easy... both married to actors. Yes. <laughs> I know. It's, I feel awful. It's all, it's like, it sounds horrible, you know. Like, a really easy hack for that is, um, like, <laughs> is just asking them, like, so what? Ma- you know, tell me about some things that make you smile. Um, and oh, that's good. They'll yeah, probably nice. smile at some point. Ooh, I'm gonna steal that's that. Good. That's a good one. Smiling that's a really good away. one. At all. Cassie, we've been doing this show for 343 episodes, 44 episodes. That's the oh first time I said that. That's so good. That's a no, great one. I, I give hacks all the time. Yeah. I gave, throwing I diamonds gave, out but, but a yeah good one. the other hack remember cassie we talked about it at lunch like ask when you're gonna pitch or write a treatment or write a lookbook or whatever and you're, you're trying to get a job like ask the people you are gonna send it to what they are looking for from that document or literally like hey i'm super excited right about this treatment like is there anything specific you want me to touch on that is like how you're gonna choose a director when i first started pitching i would be like I would never even acknowledge that there's a competition, you know, but right. now I'm just like, Hey, I'd really love to get this job. So like, tell me, Who like, do I have to murder? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. but tell me like, no, how are you going to, how are you going to pick a director? Right. Um, and if they're like, well, we're probably just going to pick the same person that did it last year. <laughs> um, <laughs> then I'll be like, thanks. Thank bye. You're like, yeah. Say hi to Jordan. Wait, wait has that, has that ever happened to you guys? That, like where you, you get are intel yeah. that they're like, the, it's not. Uh, oh no! No one would ever say that. It, that, like, that right? Yeah. But. Yeah. No. But you certainly. I've been in the situation where I'm like, oh, I see. We're wasting my time because yeah, it has to be a triple bid. And uh, the I'm worst not is the you choice. always see that you always see that after they award the job, which yeah, is yeah, the, yeah. you know, then suddenly it's so clear that you were the yeah. wild card option. It's like oh, truly the know. worst. <laughs> I'll I'll take somebody wasting a couple of days of my time over nailing it, be, like being the reco and not getting it. Uh, That's the fucking worst. That's the worst. Wait, has that has that happened to you? Where you were yeah. the wreck and they? I yeah, a couple Ooh. times. Like one time, the production company was like, "This is the best treatment we've ever seen," and we didn't get you it. You lost it. I lost it. Yeah, I was agency oh record too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was Amblin Entertainment. Have you so I've had yeah. this happen twice twice to me where I won the job and then they canceled the job after the I've, fact. I've shot shot things and they've canceled them for sure. But at least you got paid, right? Because like yeah, the yeah, worst yeah, yeah. is like <laughs> yeah. I mean that's pain. Yeah, I, yeah, I've had yeah. that happen too. But like the worst is what like it's like I and, and I had turned down other work. Which is yeah, like yeah, extra. yeah. And then you're like, oh, okay. that's that's <laughs> yeah. truly awful. That's when you yeah. start asking for the kill fees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Another orange, orange diamond. diamond. <laughs> no, honestly, I, I have not gotten kill many fees. kill fees in my career, but I, I've gotten a few, and they're nice. And for <laughs> listeners that don't know, a kill fee is when someone hires you to do a job, and then the job goes away, and you convince them to still pay you at least part of what you were supposed to be paid because you've done all the work to prepare for the job, blocked out your calendar for the job, etc. Yeah, I think the closer you get to the actual shoot, the more entitled one tends to be. And also yeah. like the more people who are in your corner to be like, "Hey, this person deserves a kill fee." Do you know what I mean? Like if it's like the day before the shoot and like <laughs> talent flicks yeah. or whatever, like that's a different deal than like, "Hey, you got it. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it's going away." You know. I mean, I'm sure that happened so much during COVID where pe- someone got COVID right like the day before the shoot. And then the company yeah. has to figure out, like, are we still going to pay for all this stuff, even though it's not happening? You know, I had a job, uh, my last job before lockdown um, we was supposed to be oh, yeah. two spots and that. ended up being one. And I'm not sure if the talent who is notoriously kind of a bad person, um, <laughs> if that person 
was Kanye. was faking or not. Do you know what I mean? It, it kind of felt like, oh, this person is like kind of letting on because they want out of this job. Uh, is no. kind of the the vibe that I got, but also we didn't have any sense of how serious anything was about to get. Right. Like that was like March two thousand twenty. <laughs> it was it was Mar- it was March uh, yeah to twenty twenty. And I remember I being in the conference room after the PPM and seeing one of the agency people taking the big jug of hand sanitizer that was in the middle of the conference room and stealing <laughs> some. He was he pumped it into his empty personal hand sanitizer because we couldn't it was about to be that situation where you just couldn't get it anymore that was the actual moment i was like i'm gonna go grocery shopping (laughs) (laughs) so before we move on i want to make sure we get back you said you have five tenants of action directing you gave us one what are the other four okay so (laughs) the this this all came about from try on air but (laughs) <laughs> Basically, I have, you know, the I call this the don't be boring approach to action. And there's kind of five principles that I always follow when putting together an action scene. And this might not work for other directors, but it works for me. So, it's a working list. It's not prescriptive. Don't no Nobody send Cassie a mean email if, because she left something out. It's fine. <laughs> it's your working anyway, theory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so rule number one is story and character drives the action. Because no matter what you're doing, it's like, if you don't care about these characters and like, why are they running from this Mm -hmm. avalanche? Or like, who are they fighting? Or who's chasing them? Or why are they driving this car? Like, you're not going to be invested in the scene. Otherwise, you have like, basically a music video with... Yeah, like, why would you run from an avalanche? (laughs) <laughs> Pussy. Yeah, exactly. You know, and 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 it goes further too, because like it's like story and char- when I say story and character drive the action, it's like how are these people running from the avalanche? Like James Bond with like some fancy skis from Q probably can get away from the avalanche a lot better than you know this poor bitch who's on her ski vacation and has never you know learned how to ski Mm -hmm. and her fiance set her up and then all of a sudden there's an avalanche you know so it's like you have to really think about how the stunt choreography and everything is designed with who these people are in mind um and like why are they there like why are we invested because like some of you know some of the most simple scenes can be really exciting if you care about the characters right so it's Mm -hmm. like those are like rule number one. And, and you know, it's like when you're when you're putting the whole thing together, it's like you have to consider the story and the characters as you're designing the set pieces and the humor and the other characters and the, you know, the stunt choreography. Everything stems from that. Right. Um, Do your treatments have Cassie's five rules of action in them? Some, mm, Just not as a page filler? Usually. Actually, not really in commercials, but in in the feature because I've only I've only pitched on action movies and like that's everyone's biggest question is like, can you direct action? So yeah, they mm-hmm. want to know like this is how What's I kind of came up with them as I yeah, yeah. I got thrown into an action movie pitch and they're like, how are you going to approach the action scenes? And then so yeah, I like run through these tenants and then explain in this movie like you know like in this scene this character is going to approach it like this because, so I kind of like give examples, but yeah, I, I definitely put this in the pitch. Um, but going off that rule number two is, and we, we talked about this. It's the second more, most important rule or in is shoot for the edit. So when I say that you, that means you pre-plan. So for me, like that's storyboarding, like really detailed shot lists. When you're directing cars, I think like mapping it out, like usually mm-hmm. I'll draw like an overhead map with the streets and have little model cars and kind of run through that with the stunt coordinators and really kind of figure out how, like, first of all, what is the geography? Like what's happening? And then what are the angles and how are we putting this puzzle together? Because, you know, it's like, especially in an action scene, you're literally holding on shots for less than a second, it, even in features, which is a really fast cutting pace. But like, you need to know how these pieces are coming together because otherwise it's just overwhelming and you're not going to get it done. And, and it's, it's also dangerous. You know, you have to like know exactly what's happening in relation to it, each other, you know, or else people are going to get hurt. Rule number three is set up the geography, then move the bloody camera. So the thing is, is like, you know, you can't be 
all over the place. And, you know, like I think, I think quantum of solace is a good example in the opening of when this didn't work, where it was all, you know, you, you couldn't tell what was happening. The camera was jumbling all over the place and you had no sense of like where the characters were moving through the space and where they were going. So I think it's, a, it's really important to set up like a perfectly timed wide shot to like establish the geography, unless you're deliberately trying to disorient your audience. But like, once you set up the geography, move the bloody camera. Like, this is right. not, you know, Mad like Max I, is so good at that. The original Bad Boys apparently had a low budget at the time, and like, like Michael Bay is a genius at this. It's like you want foreground wiping the frame. You know, you 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 can naturally create a lot of excitement if you just like fling a camera around. You know, like mounting cameras to cars, like having dirt hit the lens, like some camera shake, like even sometimes on. If I have Russian arms and jibs and it's too calm, I'll like add camera shake and post even to give it a little bit of excitement. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'm pretty carefully planned with the boarding, you know, as I'm, but then in terms of the actual shooting style, like I like it to be lit well, but there is something beautiful in action about having some unpredictability in the camera movement. And that just naturally creates some danger and excitement that's translated to the audience, you know? So, and, and with that mm-hmm. said, like, cut fast baby you know like you you can build up tension by having speed in the edit and the adrenaline and the the shooting style so like a visceral shooting style with not even if you're not even doing anything crazy even if it's just a tracking shot suddenly you're there's a lot more excited excitement translated to the audience you know yeah Um, and michael bay is famous for moving the camera like on two axes right like he'll mm -hmm. pan and track at the same time and it gives the illusion of just really fa- even on a close up right he's just establishing a character he'll do like a round dolly yeah that pan. circle the low yeah, yeah sure. the low tracking yeah. circle dolly it's i mean but that that kind of sh- it's just like yeah camera movement just makes things feel so dramatic and exciting right. and well it makes especially the background for action. Move super fast yeah number 4 gravity is a bitch so what i mean by that is things like you know, gravity, velocity, velocity, the laws of physics, these are things you can tangibly see. And, you know, throwing an actor on a green screen isn't necessarily the right way to go about it. And, you know, obviously, you sometimes have to supplement with VFX, but like, if at all possible, do it in camera. I think that's why Top Gun Maverick, like got such a great reaction this summer, because like, it's been so long since we've just seen people's faces get distorted by you know you know they're literally like g-force like, yeah <laughs> yeah there you can see the g-force on their faces like that's real you know and like and i think atomic blonde is a, a good example of like that stairwell scene is so mm. exciting because you it, and it, it's a simple scene it's three people fighting in a stairwell and that to me was like so much more exciting and entertaining to watch than like a lot of these big superhero temples where it's like, oh, they're blowing up New York and every- and you can just tell everything's fake and these actors are on green screen and it's not how gravity works. So, and, you know, unless I, unless it's like part of the style of your film, like I think Kingsman's a good example of where they use the vfx style as like part of the visual language of the film. You know, like as much as possible, do it in camera because it's just, it looks so much better. Rule number five, the caveat is like, you know, it doesn't, rule number five is have fun with it. And the caveat is like, that doesn't really work if you're making a serious drama, but I don't really do that. So like, to me, it's like action is meant to be fun and entertaining. So like throwing in some humor or jokes, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. really goes a long way. You know, and I think there's something just naturally entertaining and funny about almost dying like if you ever had a near miss on the 405 you know like i don't know about you but my first reaction is to laugh like oh my god i can't believe that that was scary haha <laughs> you know so i think just like adding that natural sense of humor into your action scenes really goes a long way because you know it, it's like again action isn't meant to be like i think some you know there, in the last couple of years there's been a real darkness that people have you know, tried to put in their action movies. But to me, like, in, so in Dark Knight, when they're in that chase scene with the, you know, with the semi, and then mm-hmm. the bat cycle comes sure. through, there's those it's, kids, like... It's the Akira you know, like, shot, adding, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, 
like the the humor really ups the entertainment value and it gives you a break because you, your audience needs a breath too so you have to like the the jokes yeah. kind of make the perfect action scene i think that goes to the sense too that like action's a lot about pacing and it's it's like you're kind of telling a joke too in a way so it's like you kind of need to land the punchline before you then you go to the next scene or whatever you know well so, and i, I think know. also i you know um, it's the rhythm thing to your, to your point about it bringing it full circle, character driving the scenes, most characters, but not all of them, but most characters would react in in the way that you're describing with like laughter or wanting to break the tension or, you know, people cope a lot of different ways. And some people <laughs> just like sh- shove it down and, you know, uh, punch bad guys because their parents are dead. But, you know, other people... Uh, would make a joke just to, to make everyone feel a little bit better as a way of acknowledging how intense it was. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of different ways to deal with it. That That's my thing with... I mean, and I guess it depends on like exactly the style of the movie, but in the in the classic action sense, like a lot of these premises are batshit crazy. You know mm-hmm, what I mean? Mm-hmm. No, it's like, this isn't It grounds real. it for someone to be yeah. like, well, whoa, I mean, like, that was crazy. Like, yeah. Like the audience is there to have a fucking fun time. Yeah. So like give them a fucking fun time. You know, yeah, yeah. no one's there to like find the meaning of life yeah, yeah. through like, right. you know, Transformers 7. I mean, yeah. maybe you are. But. Sure. Maybe you, you might are. Might as well have a good know. time doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quite possibly. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, I know we need to wrap up soon. By the way, those those five tenets are awesome. Let's jump to your your feature real quick. Can you just tell us a little bit? Matt is prepping a feature right now. We've talked a lot over the last you know ten to twenty episodes about financing, development, how long it takes, all that stuff. Can you tell us a little bit about? your feature, where the script came from, where the concept came from, and where it is now in its evolution of, as a movie? Right. Well, yeah, features take forever. And especially when you're making action movies, I found out you can only light someone on fire so cheaply. So <laughs> unfortunately, that usually requires a bit of a budget. So yeah, I mean, I've, I've been trying to find scripts that are cheaper, but the, the one I've settled on is probably in the... 15 to 20 million range Mm -hmm, you know depending mm -hmm. um but this came to me so during the middle of the uh the pandemic my best friend jason hellerman he's a really talented writer he wrote shovel buddies shout out to jason hellerman download shovel buddies so like throughout the years like i've sent him everything i've ever written you know I, i give him feedback on scripts so he has a really good sense of the kind of stuff i like and the fact that I have the emotional depth of a teaspoon. So, you know, he, he's the heart. I'm the violence, basically. Um, but anyway, during the pandemic, we were working for this blog because, like, it was like, oh, my God, all the commercials went away. I'm never going to work again. So he wrote this book called How to Write a Screenplay During Quarantine. And then they wanted they, the publication he works for, No Film School, they hired me to, like, make a little video about it. And basically, so we were at my studio shooting this thing it was just you know i hadn't seen people in like months right so it was like the summer of the first wave of covid and basically we're just bitching the whole time right you know i'm bitching about the industry so like we're just complaining about hollywood all this stuff so that weekend i like go edit the thing and i'm like you know contemplating the dark choices that led me to get here and hellerman took the more productive approach and wrote a screenplay called my masterpiece about an assassin named cassie who also drives a bright red jeep uh, who works for a corporation of assassins that do her dirty, but it's basically like a dark comedy metaphor for Hollywood and workplace inequality. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, kind of like in a Deadpool style where it's just taking the piss out of it all. I was like, this is fucking genius. So we went back and forth and then I did the whole deck and, you know, put together a, like a pitch packet. And and were you repped at this time or anything? This is what I was just going to mention is like, the importance of, of relationships. So meanwhile, my best friend, Mary, like my college buddy, she's a producer at Marvel and she introduced me to agents at CAA. And so like right at the, when Hellerman wrote the script for me, my other best friend literally connected me to CAA. They got, I got signed by CAA. And I mean, like, this is why agencies are super useful because they were able to get the script to Stallone's company 
Stallone's company, Balboa Productions, liked it. These are the people that have the relationships with exactly who he'd want to make the film with. And the the producer, Braden, he's like amazing, but he had just produced Nobody, which is Ilya Nashler's film. And he, he's also repped at Great Guns, but he's like one of my biggest idols. He's probably like one of the most talented action directors coming up right now. He did that movie, Nobody. And so like that was like number one on our ref, you know, like our comps. Like that's kind of same scale, same mm-hmm. kind of scope, like that was very much in the wheelhouse of what we wanted this to be. So all those pieces just kind of came together. And then, so it's like, Oh great. We have the production company, you know, we have the producer. So the process of getting a lead actress attached took probably took a year to be honest. It's Mm -hmm. because also a lot of these actresses have exclusivity windows. So you can send it, you know, you'll send it to this one actress. She has a month to read it or pass Mm -hmm. and you can't send it to anyone else. So she passes. So it's just like, geez, you know, so it, it takes forever. But again, it's like, you know, I feel weird even talking about this because it's not real yet, you know, until because it's such sure. a long journey. It's like now. So, OK, great. We got those pieces. And I think now Wait, did it's you meet with been, Stallone? Yeah. So that was pretty freaking cool. Was it were you nervous at all? Or Because it's not it's like one thing to meet him and like, oh, it's, it's cool that he's mm-hmm. Stallone. It's another to meet him as the creator slash director of a movie that you want him to be in and it's also your first movie right yeah i mean i just feel like being a director is kind of like a constant wave of nervousness like if you don't have an (laughs) ulcer you're not doing your job directly right (laughs) but you just have to kind of like you know it's like once you get in the room it's like you just you just i guess again it's like yeah it's like you have to kind of let your passion carry you and just this is what it is love me or hate me baby you know it's like (laughs) But, you know, yeah, no, no, I think that's exactly right. Well, you know, that meeting went well. People sense, you know, anxiety for sure. He's he's going to be in it. So that's exciting. (laughs) (laughs) This is maybe a a dumb question um, because you're such an action fan. But like, was he especially, you know, a thing for you? I feel like I, I, you know, you're younger than I am, but like I kind of miss the boat on Stallone a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Like there are plenty of icons that you, if you're at a certain age, you just, you're not seeing them. Like Rambo had come and gone when we were kids. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Rocky and yeah, all that stuff. And so like by the time. He's like a mentor now, right? Of like, yeah. like you look at the Creed films. And well, stuff yeah. Like, like I mean, yeah, you yeah, know, of course, of course. Yeah. I'm not, I'm no disrespect. What I'm saying is, is that like, did you find him young or was it something that you discovered a little bit later? Cause I feel like sometimes those early idols when you're super young, you just, it's like, honest, it, they're so untouchable. Do you know what I mean? We uh, had TV banned when I was a kid. So like we, there was a period of time where we were not allowed, not to, allowed watch to watch TV. TV. You're not the first um, filmmaker to um, have told us that. Yeah. yeah. And to play in the backyard a lot, but I think mm-hmm, that that mm-hmm. helped in a way because you know, if you blow up your brother, like that's, <laughs> That's like practice, right? I missed a lot of movies when I was young Mm because, you know, like my my parents weren't big cinephiles and they weren't like action junkies. I always liked action movies. And then when I, I think in college, you know, you, you're like, what is this? And then you just kind of go on a deep dive of like Mm -hmm. all the Rocky movies and all the Rambos and you're like, you know, or Mm -hmm. Cobra. It's like, this is the shit, you know? So it's like, I think when I was really getting into filmmaking and just yeah i mean and i think in college like i was really kind of discovering mm-hmm. what kind of movies i wanted to make because i think you know there there was a point when i wanted to be a serious filmmaker sure. and that, yeah. that it didn't really like click until i realized like it's okay you're just gonna you're here to blow things up it's fine you know you don't have to make shawshank redemption i don't sure. think i'm like proud right. to do that right. you know <laughs> It was just like in discovering the things that I was really excited and passionate about. It's like, yeah, who's bigger than Stallone and Schwarzenegger, right? It's like they kind of invented. Did action. like Stallone watch your commercials? Like, did you show him any directing work? I I don't know. Uh, not in the meeting. Like my agent sent over all my stuff, you know, beforehand, and then the deck too. So it's like, yeah, like. The, the, my agents sent, o- sent over the reel of stuff I had. And then the, the decks actually, that if there was like one tidbit I could give to directors, mm-hmm. and I, I didn't know this when I was in college or like coming up, like get good at pitching and get really good at making decks. Because if you can make an amazing deck, like 
that's how you can win a job, you know? And it's like, obviously you have to deliver on that, but like, if you have a, if you don't make good decks and you're making shitty decks, you're never going to get the job. Like you have to sell people on your vision and a lot of ways they won't even meet. You obviously do that in person, but they have to see the deck too to sometimes even get the meeting, you know? And I think that's like a huge boon of being a commercial director is like, we're trained in this world and we never, you know, it's like, like the the way I even got in the feature world is MGM found my reel on free the bid. And it was like, you know, I, I they were looking for a female direction for an action thing. I got a call. I wasn't at CAA at the time. I was at the smaller agency and I had never got even, they never sent me on any meetings or anything like that. There's literally no way. I thought it was a prank call. My agent called me at the time. It was like, MGM is interested in you for a $40 million action. And I was like, haha, it's in April Fool's. And the way that all happened was from, you know, they saw my reel and then I got to pitch on that movie. And I was one of three pitching on it because I had a great deck that I was able to churn out in like two or three days. Cause they were, you know, and, and all that training from commercials is how I got that opportunity. And unfortunately the studio head then got replaced and they canceled the movie, but, sure, but sure. that got me But the fact, I mean, that like shot me, that showed that I could pitch mm-hmm. at a studio level and the, the only reason I knew how to do that and to put these visually exciting decks together was from commercials. Like I think all of us have such a leg up by having the training of doing this constantly and having to pitch your vision and stuff, you know? Uh, yeah. A hundred percent. I wonder, uh, I'm curious to see what the next generation, what their multimedia skills are like. Do you know what I mean? Like, I 100% agree. I think commercial directors have a distinct leg up just in terms of like having sharper layout, Photoshop design skills. But I yeah. wonder I wonder if like people 10 years younger than us are going to be like, yeah, I haven't written a report ever. All of my high school projects, you know, from like freshman year on, I just was making decks as my like form of like training. Do you know what I mean? Like... Like it, it'll yeah. be just native for them and it won't be a, a thing that like lets yeah, us in the way that video out. is, you yeah, know, a hundred percent. Any kid now, like my six year old daughter knows how to shoot and shoot and edit right and like add yeah. cool, weird effects and stuff that like we spent our lives learning how to do like now an AI just does it. Your deck that you sent to Balboa pictures for your movie, is there any video yeah. content at all or is it just text and images? It was just text and images, but I did a scene breakdown similar to like how I was describing earlier, you know, where um, like I I went through uh, the story, the cast, like all the, you know, the action tenants. And then I did like a breakdown of a scene and like I would shoot it this way, you know, Um, but I have a really good in hindsight image. Yeah, I mean, I think it was like 50 pages long. It was like a lot went into that, but um yeah, in hindsight, and now I that was I think that was like two years ago now. So now I've I've recently graduated to doing the GIF treatment. So <laughs> sure. the treatment would be even better these sure. days. But, yeah, yeah. You know, like I yeah. I don't know. I have always I almost make them like I spend a lot of time on the treatments, even in commercials, because like that to me is that's the job. That and the storyboards to me are kind of like how you're communicating the vision, you know. And so mm-hmm. I, I almost make them like graphic novels, like you know, some of the borders. I'll try to like whatever the theme of the project is. I'll try to like, you know, make the whole look and text and font mm-hmm. of everything like in theme. So it almost feels like posters for the movie or a graphic novel for the movie, you know? Well, Cassie, it's been great having you on. Um, you're it's been emotional guys. <laughs> it's been emotional. <laughs> uh, I feel like our listeners are going to have a lot of thoughts and reactions and you're, your tenets of action directing are so fun. Your feature story is so fun. Like, yes, you have CAA and Stallone and all that stuff, but it did come out of like a moment of despair in your own studio where you're shooting your own <laughs> thing, where you're just shooting it, you know. Um, and that's ups and like, downs, right? Yeah, that's yeah. kind of how this <laughs> yeah. industry works. One day you want to kill yourself, and the next day you think you're going to get an Oscar. So, <laughs> 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 hills and valleys. Yeah. 
and that's what hopefully this show's about. Yeah, we should have called it Just Get Through It. <laughs> Just Get Through It, yeah, exactly. That's Just hilarious. don't quit. But if you'd like to quit, that's totally fine with it's us. It's totally already reasonable. Tweeted, we right? understand. We get it. Most yeah. competition. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> um, do you have a second to stay with us and endorse something? Of course. Unpaid endorsements. So my unpaid endorsement, I know it's a little vague, is uh, writing a list, your to-do list, at the top of the morning. I always have a to-do list running and like... As opposed to the night before? Or when as a, oh, oh, night before is okay too. But really the point is, is a, a concerted amount of time, a concentrated amount of time, where you just give yourself a few minutes to think through what are all of the important things I need to get done today that need to be done today. And it needs to be like a manageable amount, but like doing it at the top of the day before you're getting emails or, you know, like make yourself a coffee, do the list. Cause what inevitably happens for me is midday. I've kind of run out of gas. I'm a little distracted. I've got Twitter going and the baby's crying. I need to go make lunch. You know, there's a bunch of stuff, right? But if you have the list, you can go back to it and know, oh, this is the next thing I need to get done. So I was smarter in the morning. That was That's when I'm at my sharpest. So I just was really clear with myself of this is what, I'm, what I need to get done. And I know that sounds really obvious, but it, it had been a major part of like my productivity when I was younger. And I kind of just had stopped doing it because, you know, whatever, emails come in, life gets in the way. And just the other day... Yeah, I'm well before that though. Just honestly, laziness. I just feel like COVID ruined, threw me off my to do list. Just all, all yeah. that. I just, whatever happened, I just stopped. You know, I, like I said, I keep a list and we have all these different things, but like at the top of the day, planning what you intend to do. It just, the other day I did it, I was like, why don't I do this anymore? And so I did it and I felt like I had superpowers. It was the most productive day I've ever had, uh, and like, or at least in a long time. And like I said, it's for those moments where you lack clarity, when you're feeling restless, when you're feeling unsure. Look at the list. You figured it out for yourself already. And so uh, that's my endorsement. Make a, make a list when you're clear headed. You shouldn't write something so broad that it's not actionable. Write, write award winning screenplay isn't really helpful. Write for an hour on your screenplay is maybe a little bit more actionable or, or write like a write scene. Five log lines. Or- yeah. Yeah. Th- there are ways, there are tactics to kind of like make it a little bit more digestible basically. But I think a common thing I've heard many, many times is that like the people who are the most effective in their lives are setting a realistic list of goals for the day. And Cassie, what you got? Have you guys heard of Canva? Yes. Yes. Dude, it's the shit. It's amazing. Tell me what you like about Canva. I want to know. Okay. So I had for a long time been trying, like InDesign's great. And I was trying to get, you know, especially for treatments, I was really trying to find a way to get more gifts in there in an easy way for the Mm -hmm. viewer to see the treatment. But InDesign is a pain in the ass. And I really like, especially when you, you know, you have like a, a couple days to make a treatment. Like Keynote is great, especially with when you pair it with Photoshop to like, you know, mm-hmm. like put your treatment together. It's easy to use. You can slap some stuff in there, move it around. It's not like really cumbersome from mm-hmm. a user point of view. But putting video in there is a pain in the ass and you can't really upload it. And even with InDesign, I never really thought I, I might, this just might come from my lack of knowledge, but I never found like a great way to just like, you know, get that Drop out for in. people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just try. And then I, somebody sent me a treatment, you know, they, they sent me, they, like a friend showed me their treatment and it, it was like, had all these cool gifts, but it was like a really easy to use web website. Mm-hmm. And it, it said created in Canva. So I like, I was like, what's this Canva? And I went in there and it's, it's great. Like it, it has like the ease of keynote and you can layer all these videos in there. It has like a bunch of pre-made transitions, but you can customize it too and drop in all your own content you created in Photoshop or whatever. And then you use like gift gun and it was amazing. It, it's like everything I had been looking in a program, you know, to create these like interactive treatments in a really user-friendly organized way. You can just email the link to people. 
And that's awesome. Fucking awesome. Fucking awesome. Lauren, what you got, sir? I'm going to give some real basic ones, like as basic as it gets. Ooh. House of the Dragon, man, season finale <laughs> last night. It just, oh, like, I haven't I, watched it. I couldn't sleep because I was like so affected by what happened. And it's like a completely fiction, but I'm like frustrated. I'm like, you know, there, there's like tension, so much tension in that show. I love it, but also it's like it's a show that, they know they're going to have a lot of seasons. So, mm-hmm. you know, Shit, the end of the first season yeah. is like, uh, it's like the end of the first act. And you're like, what? And I have to wait a year for the <sighs> the adventure to start. Anyway, on my basic run, Taylor Swift's new album, Midnight. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Not bad. Uh, and uh, Trader Joe's veggie chicken nuggets. Have you had those, Matt? No. No, no, no. Come no. on. Yeah. You haven't had the veggie, the 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 no chicken nuggets from Trader Joe's. You know, even when I ate meat, I didn't love chicken nuggets. And what? Like, like Were you I, a child ever? Yeah, I mean, they're just not. They're kind of gross. Chicken dinos? No. No, not really. Literally, my dream as a child was to grow up to be an adult that's wealthy enough to buy a twenty-piece chicken nugget meal at McDonald's for myself. That was mm. like my. <laughs> the, the north star of my life have, goals have um, you done it yet no nah, i realized oh, not, not yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh trader joe's has the impossible chicken nuggets and they're just yeah, they're probably you know, good. i eat meat i eat real chicken nuggets and they're they're really great and then uh last thing just some medical advice because you know why would you <laughs> tune into this podcast I had a, a pretty serious uh, muscle injury in a soccer game what were you? It, an, an oai it's like an or an old age injury where you're just old and you just like don't stretch and you run for like 10 seconds and like tear your <laughs> calf muscle. You guys know about RICE, R-I-C-E? It's an acronym of like what to do if you like injured a muscle, sprained an ankle. And then no. Anything. Rest. No. Ice. Yeah. Rest. Ice. Ice. Yeah. Those are. Call 911. Comp- compress. <laughs> Compression. Yes. And elevate. Ooh. Yes. Elevate. Put your. Ooh put your limb up you know usually above your heart um uh and then you, you know you can take ibuprofen or, uh, to reduce swelling but um like every doctor slash sports person slash anyone's had an injury like all knows this acronym that i didn't really know but uh yeah race if you have an injured muscle obviously you know if it's serious you should see a medical professional but <laughs> if you're just trying to treat it at home because you, yeah, you just... don't have health insurance race it up dude <laughs> Race it up. Well, Cassie, if people want to learn more about what you're doing, is there a website, an Instagram account somewhere, Twitter, they should follow you? Yes. You can go to www.cassandrabrooksbank.com. Very original. I know. I'm C Brooksbank on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for coming. If you guys have your own tenets of action directing or in any genre of directing, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at justshootitpod at gmail.com. You can find us across all social media at justshootitpod. You can find me. I'm on Twitter at smiteypileg. I'm on Instagram at ocaplin. And I'm at Mr. Matt Enlow. I'm going to hop on Twitter when this episode goes live. I'm going to list out all of your action principles. Hop on, chime in. Tell us your favorite. Tell us maybe ones that we haven't thought of. Let's uh, let's keep this list going. Let's get collaborative. So that's my social media shout out. This episode was edited by Noah Bayshore. Thanks, Noah. And you're listening to music provided by the Free Music Archive and the artist is our. Thanks. Bye.